Congressman, I'm so glad to have you with me today. I want to have a conversation with you that, honestly, we haven't been able to have. As a nation, we haven't been able to talk about President Biden's mental competency. But you've been talking about it. You've been talking about it openly. You recently tweeted the following. You said, Biden won't finish his term. Everyone knows he's unfit for the job. His mind is too far gone. This can't go on any longer. He needs to resign. You think he will not make it through the end of his first term? Well, I don't, Will. I mean, look at the, look at kind of the, the, the way he's, you know, he's, he's gotten worse as time's gone on just since he's been president. And, he, and I think that it's just going to continue to get worse. Unfortunately, the natural course of this type of issue, you know, the cognitive issues that come along with aging is they get worse with time, not better. And you have fewer good days and more bad days as time goes on. And I think we can already see that happening with him just in the year and a half that he's been president. I mean, it started in my mind when he was a candidate. And that's when I first started making the call that this guy may not be, uh, you know, cognitively fit to be our president. I mean, I think he had a window where he could have, you know, probably been, you know, uh, he could have been president. He, he was, you know, he had his abilities about him, but that window's closed. He's too old now. And I just don't, I don't see him making it the, the, uh, the remainder of the time. He's the oldest living president in American yeah. history. You've served three presidents as the White House physician. What is it that you see in Joe Biden that tells you he is unfit? I hear you using the term cognitive decline, but tell me specifically, what do you see? Well, I, I see the same thing that everybody else in the country sees. And I've told people before, you don't even have to be a physician to, to really see this anymore. I, I think that I see him, him, him being very slow, being frail. Uh, I see him being forgetful, uh, confused. Uh, he shuffles when he walks. Uh, he's, he's got a, a, an issue with his temper now. He's very short tempered now. All of these things are physical and mental manifestations of cognitive decline that's related to age. And I think that uh, a lot of people will know this. A lot of people see this because a lot of people have had relatives that have had the same issues and they've seen this happen to family members. And so when they see Joe Biden, they're like, I, I've seen that before, you know, in, a, in an aunt, an uncle, a mother, a father, something like that. So uh, I think that that's what's going on. And I, I know the rigors of, of being, you know, of this job physically and mentally, what it takes to do the job as president. You have to have a lot of endurance. He doesn't have the endurance right now. We can see that they, they really slim his days down. He doesn't start very early. He finishes uh, pretty early. You know, they, they roll him out for short periods of time. Uh, they just this recent overseas trip. He'd just been to another overseas trip, and they said they had to split him up into two trips because they didn't think that, uh, you know, it, 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 he would be able to do it, them together. It would be too long for him, and a lot of that was based on his age, and they even openly admitted some of that. So I just I think that his age is a really big factor right now, and unfortunately you can get away with a lot of different you know, professions and jobs and, and not be at the top of your game, but being president of the United States is not one of them. I mean, we need somebody who's at the absolute top of their game and he's at, he just is not at the top of his game. You know, Congressman, um, I'm, I'm no physician. You're the physician for this conversation, but just as an armchair quarterback, it does feel like that we have started to, um, pathologize or turn everything in, in our country into a clinical diagnosis. In other words, there's no such thing as a jerk anymore. Now a jerk has a personality disorder. Right. Um, so what we used to may have just described as senility, someone's just getting old, always turns into some type of clinical diagnosis. Right. Is there one for Joe Biden? Are we looking at signs of dementia? What is it beyond what we used to just term senility? Well, you know, I, I've said before, since I'm not his doctor and since I haven't, phys haven't examined him and you know, and, and done all those things that are required to actually make a diagnosis. I, I, I think I, I do want to stick to, you know, what a lot of what a lot of people have said all along. You need to be able to examine a patient to make a diagnosis on it. You shouldn't be trying to diagnose people from afar. So I, I just group it into some type of age related cognitive decline. But it, it could be a variety of things. It could be multi infarct dementia. It could be uh, Alzheimer's. It could be Parkinson's. There's a lot of uh, of diseases out there that cause things like this. And as far as the exact diagnosis, I wouldn't you know, make a, make, uh, make a guess on that, but there's something happening. We need answers. You know, his physician owes it to the country. His job is to, is to keep the country informed about the health of the president as well. And he's not doing that. He did a physical exam on him uh, a while back and it was very superficial, the physical part of it in general, but there was nothing, no mention whatsoever of any cognitive testing or assessment of any sort. 
And one of the reasons I always got so spun up about this is you remember whenever President Trump was uh, president, that they, they were relentless in coming after me about uh, him having a cognitive test. They were saying he wasn't cognitive or physically fit to be president. And, you know, I, I mean, in my opinion, they were saying that because they didn't like the nature of his tweets. They didn't like his style. And they were looking for any reason to get rid of him. Obviously, they'd been trying to do it for a while. And this was just another attempt to get rid of him. But they did make the case like, hey. You know, we, we need to have our president needs to be cognitively tested. You know, we need to know that the president's capable of doing the job mentally and physically. And so we submitted and we did. We did a physical exam. We did a cognitive test. We did a, the MOCA, which is the Montreal uh, Clinical Assessment, where you just say it's a screening test, screening for uh, early cognitive decline. We did that. The president did extremely well on it, uh, passed with flying colors. Uh, and, you know, the press didn't and, and uh, they didn't you know, anticipate that we were going to do that. And it wasn't just the press. It was all of these elites from academic medicine, from Stanford and Yale and Harvard and uh, everybody demanding it. And when we did it, you know, uh, it really took all that off the table. People just stopped talking about it. It just went away. But the the precedent has been set now. And I think now we have a, a president who's actually showing signs and symptoms of cognitive decline. And it, something like that would be extremely useful right now uh, to to uh, to the American people to, uh, you know, if, if they don't think he has any issues, then prove it to us, you know, uh, give us, have him take the test and share the results with us and let the country know that he's cognitively fit to be president. You know, you brought this up and I appreciate it because I was going to ask you, is it, can you, and then should you diagnose someone from afar? I think I've always heard that at least within psychiatry, unless you have a exposure to the patient, you shouldn't be making a, an arm's length diagnosis. So is what you're telling me today. I'm not making a diagnosis. Right. I'm just monitoring and seeing his decline like everyone else. I'm not making a diagnosis and I'm not even speaking as a physician to some extent. I'm speaking as a concerned citizen. I'm speaking as somebody, uh, you know, who happens to be in Congress and sees the the disastrous path that this uh, this administration has taken and the things that they're doing to our country. I'm speaking as someone who's concerned about my kids and my grandkids, and I'm not the only one saying it. It's not, and, I, and I'm like you said, I'm not making a diagnosis. I'm saying something's not right. This man's not making good decisions. Uh, he's confused. He's lost. We need to know: Does he have a cognitive issue? And we need to, his physician to step up to the plate, and they need to do cognitive testing on him, and they need to share the results with us and prove one way or another. You know, you have a new book out. It's called Holding the Line. And you talk about this in the book, um, although it hasn't yet been released and I haven't been able to read it. I've seen the write-ups, uh, the book jacket cover, the description of the book. And, and one of the things that you choose to highlight in that, that short uh, summary of the book is that you were not one of maybe the first and the last person to see the president of the United States every day. You saw three presidents. I'm talking specifically here about President Trump. Right. First one in the morning and last one at night. You brought this up a moment ago with Joe Biden and the work demands of being president the day. What is that day like? I'm sure it's different for every president. But I mean, I saw I, I saw Barack Obama go gray and I don't think it took eight years. You know, yeah. the demands on that job have to be enormous. Oh, they are. I mean, you have to juggle so many balls. You have to multitask so much. I mean, you have people coming at you from every direction all day long with domestic stuff, with national security issues. Uh, and, and you just you it, it's very, very uh, taxing both physically and cognitively. And, you know, you have to travel all over the world and you're you're, in, you're you'll get up in one one morning, you'll get on Air Force One, you'll be in Andrews Air Force Base in D.C. And, you know, 16 hours later, you're in Southeast Asia on the other side of the planet and it's nine o'clock in the morning again and you have to work a full 12 hour day. Uh, I mean, it takes a lot to do that job. And I've seen three presidents do it. I've seen three presidents do it successfully, both from a cognitive and a physical standpoint. Uh, all three of the presidents that I had a role in taking care of, I was the junior physician during the George W. Bush uh, presidency, the last three years of his presidency. I was there all eight years of the Obama administration, and I was there the first three years of the Trump administration, and they all had what it took, both mentally and physically, to get the job done. Now, you know, their politics were a lot different. Their schedules were different. You know, uh, well, uh, you know, President Bush was a super early riser. He's early to rise and early to bed, and, and President Obama got up later, but stayed up later, and, you know, and President Trump, quite honestly, just never slept. I mean, he just he was up all the time. But uh, but this is not Joe Biden. I mean, he, he he's he, if, if I were taking care of him, I'm pretty sure that it would be a, it would just be a, a huge uh, blatant difference in in in, in the, his, you know, his stamina compared to the three presidents I took care of. 
Congressman, if he's not capable of pulling the level or the length of work day that three presidents you just described did, then who's making the decisions? Well, Who is doing or performing the act of being president of the United States? Well, that, we don't know the answer to that, and that's a big part of the question. He was the one that was elected to be our president and our commander in chief and our head of state, but he's not doing it. There are other people that are making these decisions. I know there are, uh, just because uh, you know we, we we see this stuff. So I don't know if it's uh, Susan Rice, if it's Ron Klain. I mean, you know uh, who it is, but. Uh, there are other people that are making these decisions and he's being used as somewhat of a front man and they're funneling some of this stuff through. I think they give him just enough information uh, for him to get out in front of the camera uh, for a brief period of time, read the teleprompter and then, and then whisk him away. But I, I doubt very seriously that he's being read into and brief thoroughly on most of the issues that are out there. I imagine he's just getting very superficial look at everything. And that's dangerous because, uh, you know, uh, we don't want uh, an unelected group of, uh, you know, members of the West Wing and the cabinet making these decisions for us. We need the president of the United States, the one that the country, uh, you know, put into office uh, making these decisions. I'd love to ask you, if I could, about each of those three presidents you served. I know you have doctor patient confidentiality sure. and privilege, so you can choose to, to abstain from answering my questions, but I'll still ask them. How about that? That sounds good. Um, f- from a distance, starting with George W. Bush, at least the image that for many of us out there, the image that we, we internalized was he's kind of a health nut, always, always riding bikes, always running, I believe, out on the ranch in Crawford, um, clearing brush. It seemed like he was into exercise. You said he was an early riser. He, he was. He, he got up really, really early in the mornings. I mean, you know, uh, when, when, when I was working in the uh, in the residence of the White House and I had to be there when he got up, I'd have to get in super early because, you know, he'd come down like six o'clock in the morning. He's headed to the Oval Office uh, dressed and ready to go. And, you know, you had to kind of be there before that in case he needed something. So he was an early riser. He went to bed pretty early, too. I would say he went to bed, you know, before 10 o'clock most nights. Uh, but he, like I said, he was up pretty early. But, yeah, he, he was very, very good athlete. He was very physical. He would go out. And by the time I got to the White House, he wasn't running anymore because he had, had issues with his knees. And he started biking. He started riding mountain bikes. So uh, I showed up at the White House, and I was a pretty avid runner. And I thought I was in pretty good shape. And then uh, I – the first time I went out with him and I got on a mountain bike with him, uh, he just uh, uh, he, he just beat me down. And uh, and I was surprised. It's a it's a completely different set of muscles riding a mountain bike than it is running, you know, and I figured that out pretty quick. But but he was a great athlete. And he was I, the one thing I'll say about George W. Bush. It was all or nothing with him. He would get on a mountain bike uh, or, or work out in some other fashion. And it was just one hundred and ten percent for like an hour and 15 hour and 20 minutes as hard and as fast as you could go. We get off those bikes and he'd be covered in, you know, blood and sweat. I mean, you know, literally blood and sweat, you know, from and uh, he was uh, he, he 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 took it serious. He worked out hard when he worked out. So we're going to exempt President Trump from the answer to this question, because I can't imagine that he is the answer, although we're going to get to President Trump in just a moment. Who was the biggest health nut of the presidents you served? And I say that taking into account not just exercise, but diet. I would say probably President Obama. President Obama was very, you know, good about what he ate and very picky about what he ate. Uh, you know, he was he was very healthy. He led a, he led a healthy lifestyle. And so did Mrs. Obama. She she was into that stuff, too. So I think that helped out, you know. Um, and, you know, he, he worked out a lot, too. But his workout was a little different. You know, he would work out. Every single day. I mean, I don't think I ever saw him miss a day of working out. He worked out every single day. Uh, and whereas President uh, Bush worked out maybe like four days a week, you know, it, it, he would like to have worked out every day. But when you're riding a bike, uh, you know, you got to go somewhere to do that. So we'd have to go out to Beltsville to the Secret Service training facility or somewhere else to ride. So it was a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, whereas President Obama would mainly just uh, do some light workout with the weights and get on the treadmill and things of that nature. But he did work out every single day. His workout was a little different. He'd start out a little slower and maybe read the paper for a little bit while he's warming up on the treadmill and then break into a run. And uh, he didn't, he didn't, you know, push himself like president uh, Bush did, but he worked out more frequently. So I think it was probably a balance, you know, these different styles, but he was probably a little more picky about what he ate. But president Obama, I think this has been verified, but he also smoked. He did, but only for the first year when he got there, you know, right after he got there, uh, it was pretty obvious that, 
uh, you know, that, that he needed to stop smoking. It wasn't a great image for the president of the United States. And Mrs. Obama wanted him to quit, too. So there was a lot of pressure. So uh, the, the doctor that was there at the time, who was the appointed physician of the president uh, before I became the appointed physician of the president a few years later, I was the I was the director of the White House Medical Unit and I was kind of his backup. Uh, we got together and, and we started him on a program to try to get him to quit smoking. And he did pretty quickly. I mean, I mean I, I would say he probably smoked the first 14 months he was in the White House. And it was pretty amazing because not only when he stopped, everyone around him smoked too. All of his aides, his personal aide, everybody that was close to him, they also all smoked. But once he started trying to stop smoking, they pretty much had to try, stop smoking as well. Because, you know, you don't want to be the guy standing around smoking a cigarette while the president of the United States is trying to quit, you know. So everybody in the West Wing pretty much stopped smoking. It was pretty incredible. But uh, it only lasted about 14 months and then he quit. And people were like, well, how do you know that he quit? And I'm like, well, because I had an earpiece in my ear every day and the Secret Service calls out every single movement he makes. If he goes to the bathroom, if he steps out of the Oval Office or whatever, he can't smoke in the Oval Office. So he had to step out of the Oval Office to smoke and they'd call that out over the radio. And I can almost tell you to the day that those calls just stopped, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did did he did he quit cold turkey or was there Nicorette? Yeah, he chewed a lot of Nicorette gum, and I, I, I'm not revealing anything that's not uh, public knowledge. There, people know that he chewed Nicorette gum, but yeah, he did chew Nicorette gum, uh, you know, for a while, and gradually started working his way off that a little bit. But he did that for a while. Well, I know you got uh, an email mm -hmm. from President Obama when you openly questioned President Biden's mental competency during the 2020 election. Right. Tell me a little bit about that email you got. Well, it was kind of it was kind of interesting. You know, I, I, uh, I don't I never agree. I don't look, you know, and he knows this looking back now. I don't agree with anything President Obama did during his administration. I mean, I think it did a lot of damage to the country. I think that that's where identity politics started. Everything that happened in the Obama administration for eight solid years was about identity politics. It was straight versus gay, black versus white, rich versus poor, man versus woman. Everybody had to pick a side and, you know, everybody else was out to get them kind of thing. And that kind of started during the Obama administration. I think it's on steroids now in the Biden administration. So I'll just let for your listeners purposes, let them know, like, I don't I don't agree with anything President Obama did politically. But, uh, you know, on, on a personal level, he was very nice to me. He was very grateful for the care that I provided. He was he was good to the Secret Service. He was good to the military office, uh, to the people of uh, the helicopter squadron and Air Force One and Camp David and the valets at the White House and all of that. And so was Mrs. Obama. They were a great family to work for. I was blessed to work for three wonderful families at the White House because all three of them uh, were wonderful families. But I, I say that to set the scene because, uh, you know, I, I did have a close personal relationship with him. I you know, took care of him for eight years. You can't help but... And then I was uh, I was campaigning. I was now out of the military. I'd retired from the Navy. I'd left the White House. Uh, I was running for office in the 13th Congressional District of Texas, which is, by the way, the number one most conservative district in the entire United States out of all uh, you know, members of Congress. So it's, you know, it's, it's pretty far to the right. And um, I was driving from Amarillo to Wichita Falls, and I was almost at this event I was going to do. And I saw this uh, tweet come up from Ronna McDaniel, and she was uh, basically calling the president out because there was a video of him where you might remember the minute, I think it was back in February of 20 or something, but he had kind of forgot where he was at. He, he forgot what state he was in and he had, uh, he had made a mention of that he was campaigning for Senate. So, uh, you know, and she tweeted something out and I just was a little frustrated about the double standard. I was like, you know, I can't believe this man for, for, for forever. They were just coming after me, the, you know, the press. And like I said, the, these, uh, uh, these elites in academic medicine just coming after me every single day about this. And now we have somebody who's actually got an issue and it's crickets. You don't hear anything from them, nothing. They're just ignoring it. Right. So out of frustration, I just retweeted that. And it was a pretty benign tweet. I think I tweeted something like, does anybody remember the uh, cognitive test that I gave at real Donald Trump? The one that he aced, it looks like somebody else needs a test. It's scary. That's all I said. It wasn't that bad, I didn't think. But within 20 minutes, I mean, I get my phone's like, ding, I get this email from President Obama, you know, directly from President Obama, just tearing me up, basically. You know, starting out saying, hey, you know, I always tried to stay out of, uh, you know, I, I tried not to comment on your uh, your your service to President Trump, you know, and I considered you a friend and, you know, you, 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 you know, considered you a great doctor. You took good care of our family. And then he just kind of just started, you know, tearing me up saying, you know, uh, this was beneath you as a Navy Rear Admiral. It was beneath you in your position as a position of the president. It was a direct attack on me and, 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 and my staff and the people that worked with you at the White House and considered you a friend. And, you know, it's just poor judgment to come after Joe like that, to attack Joe, uh, take a cheap shot at Joe like this. And I hope you use better judgment in the future. And, you know, I just 
I mean, I, you know, I get, I get hate mail all the time and that this, I didn't, what wouldn't actually in the category of hate mail, but it was a scolding, but I get stuff like that on the, on the spectrum of that all day long, every day. And I always have, it doesn't bother me, but this one kind of like bothered me a little bit. I didn't know exactly. I had kind of mixed emotions about it. It was kind of a, uh, kind of a split between being pissed off about it, but also having my feelings hurt a little bit, to be honest with you. Right. And so, uh, I kind of got flustered and I was about to go into this fundraiser. I was already late for it. I was going to, type an email or type a response back to him. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this fundraiser. I'm going to come back out. I'm going to call him. I'm just going to pick the phone up and call him and talk to him. And uh, so that was my plan. And then I went in the fundraiser and I really, my head wasn't in the game. I wasn't paying attention to what was going on because I was just consumed with this, uh, with this email I got. And then by the time I walked out, I had a little time to think about it. And I thought, you know what? Before I do anything, I'm going to run this past somebody. And the first person that popped into my mind was Dan Bongino, right? Because Dan and I were friends. Dan was a Secret Service agent during the Obama administration. Dan and I traveled all over the world together. He was in very similar situation uh, at, at times, uh, you know, th- that I that I was in now, having worked for, you know, having been very conservative and working for President Obama previous to that. So I called Dan up, and Dan was like, "Look, Ronnie," he goes you don't owe this guy a damn thing. Right? He said, you know, did he, did he do anything to help you out when they were destroying you and your family during the VA nomination process? One phone call from him. He could have picked the phone up and made one phone call to Tester or anybody on the Veterans Affairs Committee or, you know, anybody else for that nature. One phone call from him and it would have all stopped. But he, you know, he, he let them tear you up and he didn't lift a single finger to help you. He goes, Ronnie, you don't owe this guy anything. And so, you know, I thought about it. I thought, you know what, Dan's right. I, I, I don't feel like I really owe him anything at this point. And I just didn't even reply to I didn't reply to the, to the email. I just let it go. Hmm. What a story. Yeah, what a scolding. And I can imagine. I mean, I understand both sides yeah. of it. I understand the anger and that it would hurt your feelings. Um, having worked for him. By the way, out of curiosity, did President Obama know when you worked for him that you disagreed with him? Did he know your politics differed? Yeah, I think so. You know, he knew where I was from. He knew I was from Loveland, Texas. My dad uh, had been mayor briefly, uh, ran for mayor when he's when he's pretty old. And um, whenever he was running for mayor, President Obama was always kind of giving me a hard time about it. He's like, well, you know, one time he told me, he said, well, I'd go, he goes, I'd go down there to Leveland and campaign for your dad, Ronnie, if I thought it'd do any good. But I'm pretty sure it'll do more harm than good. And I said, yes, sir. I said, you probably need to stay out of that part of Texas. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, <laughs> he knew. He knew that I, that I that came from a very conservative part of the country. And he, he knew that I, my leanings were probably far to the right. But, you know, I and, and I will maintain to this day, I never, ever had a political opinion when I worked for him. I just I did my job. I was on active duty. I was no different than. Uh, you know, then the Secret Service agents that were taking care of him, the pilot that was flying Air Force One or, you know, uh, the President's Helicopter Squadron or people that worked at Camp David or anything else. Uh, I was there to take care of the president of the United States as his position and to take care of the office of the president. And I was there as a as a uh, Navy active duty member. I was on active duty in the Navy, a Navy admiral at the time. And I kept my head down and I kept my political opinions to myself because that was not my job. And, and I, t- I took great care of the president and the first family. But when I got out, and I ran for office, of course, you know, none of that applies anymore. Now I'm out. I'm a civilian. I'm not on active duty anymore. And I'm running for office in the number one most conservative district in the country. Of course, I'm going to have a political opinion, right? So I, I think a lot of people in the Obama administration got really uh, upset with me when I ran for office and some of the stuff I was putting out, just pure political stuff that I was putting out. And uh, they, they felt like I had betrayed them. I was like, well, I didn't betray anybody. I mean, you know, this is who I am. I mean, I, I kept my opinions to myself when, 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 you know, when I was on active duty, but now I'm not. I mean, they should understand that better than anybody having come from the White House and being in politics. But some people took it really personal. I think that's part and parcel with the ideology, quite honestly. Yeah. That many on the left can't separate their politics from their personality yeah. nor their job, while many others understand politics is only one slice right. of your life, and there's a job to do outside of politics. Now we get to the mystery, the biggest curiosity. I said we'd come back to President Trump. You have to help me understand President Trump. Um, not one of the youngest presidents we've ever had. Admittedly, I think he would admit this as well, not the diet you would assume of champions, uh, <laughs> enjoys fast yeah. food. And yet has a bottomless well of energy, back-to-back rallies. Look, by the way, I talk on TV for a living. I used to host a solo radio show for ESPN. I know there are people that do very hard jobs in this world. It is exhausting. If you talk for three hours, you will be tired at the end of that three hours. President Trump spoke extemporaneously live to huge audiences back-to-back and then was up tweeting the next morning before the sun is up. Where in the world is he getting that energy? Well, I'll tell you, the, the one comment you made there is, is 
talking to people and doing it continuously because he actually feeds on that. The, you know, the, the, when he gets up in front of a crowd, the more excited they are and the more they're into what he's saying, the more, the, just the more energy he has. I mean, that's just who he is. He just he thrives on that. But I'll tell you, you know, everybody's different. I mean, we all know people who don't sleep very much. I mean, you know, I, I'd like to get, you know, six, eight hours a night if I could, but you know, I don't most of the time, but you know, I, I need at least five hours to on, on a long-term basis. To watch him. <laughs> he does not, he just, he's not made that way. I mean, you can go back and talk to people who knew him when he was really young. He didn't sleep. He's never slept his whole life. He's only slept like four to five hours a night. That's just what he does. And uh, maybe that's one of the reasons he's successful as he is. And he's had as much, uh, you know, uh, he's acquired the wealth that he had and everything. Maybe it was because he had those extra hours. He was up working that some of us weren't, I don't know the answer to that, but what I will tell you is that uh, the man can go nonstop and, and you're right. His diet's not great. I gave up on that a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, the exercise not going to happen. He made that pretty clear to me early on. Right. And, uh, <laughs> but I will tell you, you know, that he never drank his entire life and he never smoked his entire life. Right. Uh, so he's lived a very healthy life in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, he hasn't had the healthiest diet in the world, but like you said, president Obama had a, a, probably a much healthier diet than Trump, but he smoked. I mean, you know, I mean, and it, it, there's different, you, you, you pick different things that, you know, that, that, uh, may or may not be good for your health. And, uh, he just he, he chose not to smoke and drink. And I think it, it has had an incredible impact on his long term health. I will tell you, when I did his physical exam, they did not ask me to break down. I had the numbers right in front of me. And I figured because Sanjay Gupta was in the room when I was briefing it that day in the in the White House briefing room. I figured I would get asked. And I had all of the results from his exercise stress test, his cardiac exercise stress test for his age and his age group. He crushed it. He was in the top 10 percent of men his age on the treadmill from a cardiac standpoint, I was like astonished. Uh, and I had the numbers there, but nobody asked me, I told him that he did well, but nobody asked me to break the numbers down, but I did have them there at the time because I was, I was so uh, uh, impressed with them, but he, uh, he's just got a lot of energy. You know, we go on overseas trips and we'd be in the elevator. And like I said, I, t I mentioned this before you fly all the way to the other side of the planet. You're super tired. When you get off the plane, you got to work a full day. Uh, you know, and he's, he's, he's out talking to people, doing meetings, giving speeches, you know, meeting with foreign leaders, just nonstop embassy staff over, you know, all this different stuff. And then we get back to the hotel and it would be like 1030 at night. Everybody's dragging, barely keep their eyes open. I mean, and somebody would say, hey, there's a group of folks down in the lobby uh, that have been waiting down to see or whatever. And he's like, well, let's go down and see them and say hi to them before we go to bed. Everybody would be like, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, everybody, <laughs> I mean, nobody can hardly take another step. And he just, he, he, he wanted to keep going. So I don't know what it is about him, but he's, he's unique in that regards. Well, look, as somebody who, like, I, I, I preach better than I practice, but I'm into health optimization. I want to be healthy. I want to exercise. I want to do my best to eat right. <clears throat> There's one of three takeaways here. Number one, it's a testament. President Trump is a testament to not smoking and drinking, as you just said. Number two, possibly all the talk of diet, exercise, and sleep is highly overrated. That we have been sold a bill of goods, which I don't think is true. Or number three, we're looking at one of the biggest exceptions to the rule that there is, President Trump. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know what the answer to that is, but you're right. There's something going on there. But I, uh, you know, he, uh, as far as the exercise goes, I, I, he never really said this to me, but I kind of get the impression, you know, this is me, not him, but uh, I kind of feel like he thinks that God gave him so many heartbeats and he didn't want to waste any of them on the treadmill, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, and, and he's, you know, he, he makes a point, you know, I mean, he's, he's older now, right? I mean, he's, he's not trying to, you know, work on his six pack or something, you know, I mean, he's, you know, you, you know, your priorities are different when you're at different points in your life. And, you know, for him right now, he's, he's at a point in his life, he's old enough. He's like, I'm not going to get on the treadmill and, you know, and, and, you know, punish my, uh, my, my body at this point. Uh, you know, I don't think I need to do it. I have done it to this point. And I'm not going to do it. And he also just is like, Hey, I've always eaten kind of what I wanted. I'm going to keep doing it. So can't argue with it. Well, let's take this then full circle then, uh, back to president Biden. So, you know, we'll do our best here. To, the most interesting thing about you, Congressman, is that you served three presidents in a nonpartisan role. You are admittedly in a partisan role now. You are a Republican congressman from Texas. So I will ask you just to do your best to, to, to look at this through a nonpartisan lens, just simply from a health lens. You've already said you don't think he can finish his, his first term. So I can't imagine you see a scenario where he runs for reelection. 
he will not run for re-election. I think for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that the left's starting to turn on him now. So I think that that's a, that's just a game changer for him. And I, honestly, I think that they realize that that he he, that he can't physically or you know cognitively handle another four years. Though I think they're also thinking we'll be lucky if he makes it to the end of this term. Uh, so they're looking for opportunity to get rid of him. So right now they're talking about the the poor polling on TV and you know and I think more of the. Hunter Biden stuff's coming out, and and I don't think that that's uh, I think that's probably by design from some folks on the left to uh, to try to you know I think they're going to create problems for him where where uh, they may be able to get him out before the four years is up, even if it's not for cognitive issues. Uh, I just think that the left has now realized that they made a mistake and they've got a real problem here with the president who's not performing, uh, who uh, is not well thought of nationwide, whose polling is horrible, uh, who's, who can't make the left happy, who can't make the right happy, who can't seem to make anybody happy. Uh, and, and, and honestly, doesn't know where he's at a lot of the time. It doesn't look like. So we'll see what happens. But I think so. Go ahead. So, Congressman, on the uh, on the co- cognitive decline um, note, you know, there's times I guess this passes the common sense test in our experience with 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 elderly relatives or whoever it may be. It's not consistent. Right. Because there's times when Joe Biden seems to pull it right. off and he gives a speech with very few stumbles and answers a question extemporaneously. There are other times when he can't literally remember where he is. Is that just how it goes? Comes in waves, good days, bad well, days? Well, it does. It comes in good days and bad days. And like I said, as the time goes on, more bad days and good days. And there's good times of the day and bad times of the day. You know, the sundowners thing. And, uh, you know, uh, there's there's just uh, – we, you know, in, in medicine, we know that there's certain times of the day where people are going to be sharper that are having these issues than they are at other times. They get confused in the evenings called the sundown or whatever. But so, I mean, I think that's part of it. And the other question I have, Will, is like, are they giving him any medications? I mean, there are medications you can take, too, that cover a lot of this up for a while until it gets bad enough that the meds don't work so much anymore. But I wonder, are they giving him any medications? Uh, so let's end with this. You said it a minute ago. I think you hinted at this. And I don't know if you were hinting directly at what I'm about to ask you, but you said there are various ways in which he might not see the end of his first term do you think cognitive decline and maybe that's almost inseparable from political impotency in other words does his own party find him ineffective do you think that ineffectiveness tied to cognitive decline could lead to a 25th amendment situation before this term is up but i don't think it's likely i don't think they want to go down that path i think that first off i don't think the democrats want to admit that that uh that you know that I and others that were saying this early on were right that he was not cognitively fit to be our president. I don't think they want to go down that path and admit that. Also, that's a hard path to go down. I mean, there's two ways you can do the 25th Amendment. He can voluntarily resign, say that you know that he has a health issue or you know he's not fit to be president anymore for one reason or another, whether it's mental or physical, and he can walk away from it. Or you know his cabinet can get together with the vice president and they can decide they can vote and decide that he's not, and then bring that to Congress and so on and so forth. That's kind of a messy process. I think that. What I think is more likely is that they will let him fall on his own sword to some extent. And I think they have a perfect opportunity to do that with all the the stuff that's out there on Hunter Biden. I mean, Hunter Biden is an absolute disaster. And I'm sure there are a thousand things in Hunter's background that would that would uh, disqualify President Biden from being president. Uh, you know, and, and I think that they will quietly just look the other way and let some of this Hunter Biden stuff start blowing up. And I think that's one way that they, they might be able to. Uh, to force him out. But I'm, I, I, once again, I'm guessing, but I think that they're going to have to figure something out because I think just trying to run the clock out until 2024 is not going to be an option. Congressman Ronnie Jackson, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.